Hello, I'm Nick Fisher. Thanks for watching. I'm here to talk to you about self-promotion as a filmmaker, particularly at the start of your career. I felt the best way to talk about promotion would be to give examples, and I'm going to compare to the promotion of two different films shown on the same day at the same festival, which was Mayhem last year, that's 2016, and how they did things differently to one another, how they could have used each other's marketing techniques in some examples, and why I think particular these particular films in some ways certainly benefited from particular marketing strategies. But first, I'm going to talk about the films individually because not everything they have can be com not everything one has can be compared to the other. The first of the two films was The Resort by Steve Barker, which is a science fiction horror action adventure story set in a world post-zombie apocalypse, in which, well, no, mankind has had a war with zombies and won, and the, the, the resort itself is a holiday camp, a safari park, where people can go and shoot zombies, and things go wrong, these people get trapped in the camp, and these zombies come after them. After the resort, there was a Q&A with the director, Steve Barker. Among other things, Steve discussed the influence that other films had on his work. He said, he was attracted to it because it was pitched to him as Jurassic Park and Westworld meet Night of the Living Dead. There's more to his comparison of his work to those films than that sort of face value comment, but straight away he's comparing himself to Spielberg and George A. Romero, who are true masters of their art, which, while might not get him anywhere, I don't think in, in the industry, I think you need to be more articulate and explain yourself better than that. Certainly appeals to more casual attenders of the festival, more casual view, more casual viewers. That's the uh, the correct way to say that. I think yes. The second, I think, more important reason why what he did is good, and will benefit him, is he's demonstrating an understanding and a respect and appreciation for what's come before in the genres that he's working in, and I believe that to demonstrate that such popular films that can't speak for Westworld, but certainly Jurassic Park, huge blockbuster, the highest grossing film in the world for I think five years. To demonstrate that you can understand what's good about those things and employ them in your own work, I think will benefit him greatly. Garth Edwards, who directed Monsters, who had previous who has previously been to Mayhem as a director and as a, as a presenter, started off, yes, making monsters by himself doing the effects all on one computer, one iMac. And now he's where he's made Star Wars, he's made a Star Wars film, he's made Godzilla, all in a very short space of time. He also demonstrates when talking about how these men influenced him a lack of individuality which unfortunately does get you hired because if you have if your ideas are too too unique or your style is too stylish, it might be considered now post in post nineteen eighty Hollywood too radical to be given such an amount of money as I don't know, however much something like Jurassic Park Jurassic World costs eight hundred and fifty million dollars, two hundred million, to be given that amount of money when your idea is very unique and niche, like Jim Hawkins, who who directed the Greasy Strangler, would be risky. So he's demonstrating Maybe not necessarily a lack of style, but an ability to adapt the style to fit other people's needs. And I think that will that's very likely to get him hired making the kind of films that he clearly likes. On the on a, at a in a different area of the swatch that is filmmaking genre, The Greasy Strangler is a black comedy about a serial killer whose modus operandi is to strangle people while he is naked and covered in grease and his relationship with his son. <laughs> it's possibly the most unconventional, un-mainstream feature film I've ever seen. There was no Q&A afterwards, which I think was a mistake, which I'll go on to later. But beforehand, there was a warning, not from the director who was absent, but from one of the hosts of the festival, that I have the list here, this film may put you off pigs, penises, disco, noses, and grease. 
that, <laughs> that of course, uh, of course, mature content warnings do happen at screenings of films or even on television. You're not really being warned about that. It's more, I think, an extension of the film's sense of humour and the way it subverts genre expectations in just about every way possible. The warning before it, I think, benefited it because it was almost, it was giving you a sort of taste of the film without having to see a trailer. The Greasy Strangler also had lots of merchandise, not on sale, maybe, maybe it was on sale, but a lot of free merchandise was given out. On, it, there, were, there was promotional stuff all around the, the theatre before we went in, but each person was given a, a goodie bag containing, containing a sticker and a pen and I think a, a sort of leaflet sized, A5 sized poster for the film. Like I said with Mr. Barker, there's a sort of face value for this kind of promotion, which is people see the, the film, they forget about it maybe, but they take the merchandise away, other people see the merchandise, they become interested in that, so it's, it's extra, extra promotion. But The Greasy Strangler is a very unconventional film, as I've said, and will have a very small amount of people who really enjoy it and return to it. And I believe it's the I believe the director was expecting it and is expecting it to become a cult film. Often with with a cult film there is a very special market for for gimmick t shirts or mugs or pens or whatever it is. I think T shirts are the most popular. But that kind of merchandising where you're publicly displaying something that only a very few people will, will appreciate is often linked with cult film. That, that demonstrates a very clear understanding of who, not only whose audience were at the time, but who, are go, who they're going to be in the future. From the point of view of the audience, I think the Greasy Strangler would have been the better Q&A to go to if Mr Hawkins had, had been present and been able to do one. Why he wasn't, I, I don't know. But I feel there would have been far more to say about, about that than, than there was about the resort. Because most of what was said about the resort was in some way Miss, Mr. Barker comparing himself to Spielberg or Romero. There was so much in The Greasy Strangler that left audiences wondering. And it's, it's a film, it's certainly a film with character, because it's made by a director with, with character. And it would have been fascinating to hear what he had to say and where, where his inspirations came from. I also think that not having a, a I also think that while not having a Q and A will not damage the greasy strand, the greasy strand, it hasn't taken anything away from it. It would certainly have helped, have helped Hawkins. It, this is his first feature film, and I believe that he should have been ready to be there and promote himself and discuss his radical, for lack of a better word, ideas. But he wasn't, and that's, I dare say, beyond his control, because you would have wanted to go, who, who wouldn't? I think really that both marketing strategies, while maybe not with the exception of the merchandise of the Greasy Strangler, maybe, while maybe not a result of the, the type of film, both worked with the kind of film that they were attached to. So that's all I have, and thank you very much for watching.